Uh, perfect time for the word. God bless you. We're getting ready to get into a powerful word. I'm getting ready to do some study. Y'all want to study with me? Come on and let's, uh, let's see. You're watching the word of God through Jesus Christ Street and Ivory Telecast, and I'm very grateful that you're here, okay? Um, you can reach the ministry by calling 475-300-3850. And thank you so much for being a part of this broadcast. And watch this. Don't get caught up in the theatrics, but get caught up in the Word. God bless you. My name is Apostle Alan E. Coleman, Jr. The Lord has assigned me as apostle, teacher, and prophet of the Word of God through Jesus Christ, Street and Outreach Ministry. Thank you for joining the ministry for this broadcast that God is doing today. I don't know what he's going to do. I don't even know if he's going to have friends with me or not. I don't know, but we're going to find out. You can reach the ministry at 475 300 Five zero twenty four hours. The ministry's website is also on the screen, so that way you'll know how to join us on the web. Not only that, but periodically there will be the Cash App link on the screen so you can share love offerings to partner with us as God uses us to help others in street and outreach ministry. There's always ongoing fundraisers because God uses the ministry to help others just like he did when he walked this earth. God bless you, and let's get in here and find out what it is the Lord want to say unto us. Come on. And now, to the Word of God, through Jesus Christ, with Apostle Alan E. Coleman, Jr. God bless you, and enjoy the message. Previously, on the Word of God, through Jesus Christ, Street and Outreach Telecast. So Jacob left Beersheba and journeyed toward Haran. That night, when he stopped the camp at sundown, he found a rock for a headrest or a pillow and lay down to sleep and dreamed that a staircase reached from earth to heaven and he saw the angels of God going up and down upon it. 
at the top of the at the top of the stairs stood the Lord. I am Jehovah, he says. And Jacob vowed this vow to God. If God will help and protect me on this journey and give me food and clothes and will bring me back safely to my father, then I will choose Jehovah as my God. And this memorial pillar shall become a place for worship. And I will give you back a tenth of everything you give me. Now before you run, that didn't mean money. He said a tenth of everything. That's what he said. And Jacob was left alone. And there wrestled a man with him until the breaking of the day which in the Hebrew it actually says ascending of the morning. And when he saw that he prevailed not against him, he touched the hollow of his thigh. And the hollow of Jacob's thigh was out of joint as he wrestled with him. And he said, let me go for the day breaketh. And he said, I will not let thee go except thou bless me. And he said unto him, what is thy name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, thy name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. Which actually in the Hebrew says that is a prince of God. For as a prince hast thou power with God and with men and hast prevailed. Then he said, don't be frightened, Daniel, for your request has been heard in heaven. And was answered the very first day you began to fast. Hold that thought. Before the Lord and pray for understanding. That very day, I was sent here to meet you. But for 21 days, the mighty evil spirit who overrules the kingdom of Persia blocked my way. Then Michael one of the top officers of the heavenly army came to help me so that I was able to break through these spitted rulers of Persia. Now we're going to read our last scripture. And then we're going to get busy. So one night the king of Syria sent a great army with many chariots and horses to surround the city. When the prophet's servant got up early the next morning and went outside, there were troops, horses, and chariots everywhere. Alas, my master, what shall we do now? He cried out to Elisha. Don't be afraid, Elisha told him, for our army is bigger than theirs. Then Elisha prayed, Lord, open his eyes and let him see. And the Lord opened the young man's eyes so that he could see the horses, excuse me, so that he could see horses of fire and chariots of fire everywhere upon the mountain. As the Syrian army advanced upon them, Elisha prayed, Lord, please make them blind. And he did. The thought that God gave me for this talk we're getting ready to have is called the secret of how to move the hand of God in prayer. And this is the series. The title is Call on Backup because there's more for us than against us. And now, back to our show. In Jesus' name, I thank you and I pray. Amen. The secret of how to move the hand of God in prayer. The secret the mystery because there's some times that you can be praying about something and it may seem like God does not hear you 
It's not that he doesn't hear you. Glory to God. I feel like, see, y'all understand. I'm on a 12-hour fast every day. I've been on this fast for over a month. I'm not going to tell you what I'm fasting about, but it's several things. But I've been on this fast over a month. There's been some things I've seen God move fast in, like he said he would. There's been some things I see some movement in, like God said it would be. And then there's a thing or two that is dragging. And it's not because it's not God's will, but sometimes when God have you interceding for people and they're not capitulating to the plan of God, then there becomes a struggle. And what you have to do is you have to get in God's face. You have to get in his, everybody can't do that. You have to get in his presence and do what the Hebrews call darbar with him, which in the Hebrew language, darbar means to speak to God, and he talks back. Those of us that are filled with the Holy Ghost, with the evidence, the biblical evidence of speaking in other tongues, not when we want to, but when the Lord gives us utterance, we hear God's voice. We hear him audibly in our spirit. I can't explain that to you because if you're not filled with the Holy Ghost and have heard the voice of God, then you wouldn't understand what God is using me to say right now anyway. A lot of times when there's problems going on, you can tell the people that have heard from God because while all the chaos is going on, the people that have heard from God are calm. If they are stirred up, it's because they're passionate about the fact that they know what God can do. They're just waiting on him to do it. When Jesus walked in a room, there was a man named Jairus whose daughter had died. And Jesus went in there to raise her. And all these people, her relatives and friends, I guess, but I know it's relatives in them, but there's a lot of people in the room crying, being all emotional, all that. Jesus said, get out. Get out. Why? Because your emotion can hinder the move of God. Your no can be at odds with God's yes. Or your yes can be at odds with God's no. And if that be the case, then God has to throw his weight around and show you who's God. And surely it won't be you. In 2020 of January, the Lord led me to stand behind this podium, to stand and say on television that God said there were going to be ministries closing, there were going to be ministers dying, there was something coming that was going to shake this nation because this nation was and still is promoting a lot of ungodliness. And it's almost a smack in God's face. Why? Because God has put forth a remedy for us to be free from every kind of bondage and stress and aggravation. And it, 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 it just turns out that people want the blessings of God, but they don't want the God that gives the blessing. That's a problem. 
That's the problem. There's a lot of people watching this broadcast right now. Whether you're in your home locally or whether you are worldwide in another country, what's, it doesn't matter. There's some people watching this broadcast right now that God said your folder is on his desk and he want to bless you, but you won't let him. You're in the way. There's some of you that are looking at things you're going through and wondering when is it going to change. It would have been to change if you would just get out of the way. Abraham was put in a position where God told him to come from among his family. So now this tells us that God will separate a family. A lot of people don't believe that. A lot of people want to be faithful to their family and their friends and, 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 and help them and be the savior and the hero and all of that. And you can't do that. You can't do that because there's only one savior and that one savior, that one savior is the savior. No one else could do what he could do. None. No one else could do what God can do. Some people don't believe that. Well, he won't separate me from my family. God is love. Yeah, God is love. But God is also a jealous God. And he doesn't play. And you could be holding up somebody else's blessing by you not getting in position with God so he can bless you. You might be the blessing for somebody. And you holding them up because you won't get in position. So God got to use somebody to intercede and fight for you. True intercession is when you interfere, when you go before God as though you are that person. They should be crying, but because they're not, you have to. They should be saying, Lord, forgive me, but because they're not, you have to say, Lord, forgive them. You go before God as though you are them. Oh, those that are intercessors also, y'all understand, because this is what we do. Prayer warriors, intercessors, we fight for souls. We fight. In the Living Bible, in Genesis chapter 12, God said in verse 1 to Abraham, he was called Abram then, after the death of Abram's father, God told him, leave your own country behind you and your own people and go to the land I will guide you to. If you do, I will cause you to become the father of a great nation. I will bless you and make your name famous and you will be a blessing to many others. See? I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. And the entire world will be blessed because of you. Now notice this now. And you will be a blessing to many others, God said in verse 2. Some of you, God has chosen to be a blessing to someone. Let me give you an example. Some of us men of God are waiting for God to bless us with our wives. And I'm going to drop something on you. Let me put my head on the chopping block. Okay, well, I'll do it this way as God will leave me. God told me sometimes the best wife is not the one that the building has shaped. Why? Because she comes with a lot of mess. 
she'll come with tradition, she'll come with denomination, she'll come with respect of persons and idolatry. Oh, my pastor did this and said that and did this and walked on water and walked up the walls and danced all night on the ceiling. She'll come with all of this mess. And when you're a man of God over ministry and God uses you to teach the hardest book in the world and she come with mess, that's going to put a black eye on the ministry. So sometimes what God have to do, he has to reach down and get that sister who on the inside, he's anointed her. He's fashioned her. He's made her to be a good wife. He's blessed her to be a team player. And the man of God who can see and have the gift of discernment looks at her and looks past the flesh because see, beauty is deceptive. Well, beauty fades and charm is deceptive, as it says in Proverbs 31. So you might look good, young, and, and everything intact now, but sometime or another down the road, things are going to be sagging. And it's best to get a husband or have a husband that looks past all of that and still see the you then that he see today. That's the kind of husband that God gives to his daughter. And that type of daughter is a blessing to the husband that God gives her to. So he said to me, sometimes he got to reach down in the muck and the mire. And he got to pull that woman out and get her by herself and shape her. The inward her has to come out so that the one on the surface, the drinker, the cusser, the one that lives according to the way of the world, she needs to die. So if she don't come to God and say, Lord, I'm sorry, please help me, forgive me. She might know of God and she might have a little tiny piece of a relationship in her own way. But if she had a real solid relationship, she would understand like God said to Abraham, God said, leave your own country behind you and your own people and go to the land I will guide you to. So when she has a real relationship with God, she'll be seeking to do what pleases him and not what pleases her, not what pleases her family, not what pleases her friends. And it's the same thing with a man. Sometimes God can't give the man that's over ministry to one of his daughters that's strong in the Lord with a relationship. Why? Because that man is going to come with garbage. Garbage, as we used to say. He's going to come with denominational poison. He's going to come with trying to shape her to look like the other women in the building. He's going to tell her, sit down, shut up, and look good while I shine. No. No. You can't do that. Because when God blesses you to be over a work, a man over ministry would only marry a woman who's in ministry or ministry minded. In some cases, she just have to love God. If she just love God and she get a hold of this, this will purge the inside of her and prep her 
and she'd be a better wife than the one that's been in the building for 50 years or so. Because sometimes the blessing, the tree is in the acorn. But it takes a man of God to be able to reach the inside of her. Now watch, watch how God shift this lesson. I'm watching it. Because he's just telling all of this. None of this is written. God just giving me this to say, but I, I'm watching him because I know what the, the, the thought and the title is. And, 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 and in some ways, I'm like, Lord, what does this have to do with that? But I'm watching him now. So, when God show you your spouse, whether you're a male and he show you your wife, and she's not quite where she should be, or you're a woman in ministry and he show you your husband, but he's not ready yet. But God said, that's them. When God says, that's them. I, I'm going to be real. I'm, I got to put my head on the chopping block. I'm in a situation like that now. Where God showed me a wife and he said, that's her. Whoa. See, because... The word of God is the cleansing agent that cleanses souls and purges consciences from dead works. The word of God works along with the blood of Jesus because Jesus is and was the word of God. So when, that's why when whom the son set free is free indeed because his name means savior. Okay. Told you God's giving a shift. I see him. So now let's talk about this savior. Let's go back to Genesis 28. And I'm going to go, actually, you know what? I'm going to go on and live in the King James for this because this is big boy stuff. Genesis chapter 28, and I'm going to read verses 20 through 22. Verse 20 says, and Jacob vowed a vow. Now, remember, this was when he woke up. He went to sleep. Let me go back some so you can have some, some more background in case you forgot. Verse 10 of Genesis chapter 28, Jacob went out from Beersheba and went toward Haran, and he lighted upon a certain place and tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took of the stones of that place and put them for his pillows and lay down in that place to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder set up on the earth, and the top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angels of God ascending and descending on it. Jacob was a prophet. Those that are of the prophetic anointing, even those that have not capitulated to the call, but you have the gift of dreams and you're wondering why? Why is it that I be dreaming stuff and it happened? I, I don't understand this. Why is it that when I dream stuff, it happened? Oh, my goodness. And did you go to some ministers and I asked them about this and they say, oh, there's a call on your life. Well, what is it? Well, I, I don't know. The mistake is going to a pastor because nine times out of ten, I'm not talking about people that just call themselves pastor because everybody that stands behind one of these either call themselves pastor or apostle or Reverend, which is dumb, 
When a person called himself reverend, you can tell they are not learned at all because Psalms 111 verse 9 says holy and reverend is God's name. So when I be seeing people that call themselves reverend doctor, they should say reverend dum dum because you're not a teacher if you don't know that God's name is reverend. You don't know. If you don't know that, then stop calling yourself a teacher. Why? Because <laughs> there's going to be times where your anointing or what you say is your anointing is going to either hurt you or help you. Mm -hmm. So everybody that stands behind one of these, they call themselves apostle or pastor or bishop, as if that's a different office than pastor, which is not. Remember, here we go with ignorance again, because bishop and pastor is the same exact thing. A lot of reasons a lot of people don't know the real from the fake is because they don't know what the ministry gifts do. So if you don't know what the ministry gift does, then you can be bamboozled by anybody. If you don't know what a plumber does, then anybody can come and work on your pipes. If you don't know what a mechanic does, then anybody you will let work on your car. Huh. It's time to get into the word, the manual, so you can read and find out what these gifts, the ministry gifts, the fivefold apostle, prophet and prophetess, evangelist, pastor and teacher, what the fivefold ministry does, how they operate, so you'll know the real from the fake. God said, go this way. I'm just going to jot over to Deuteronomy for a minute. But we're coming right back because we got to finish that. But we're going to go to Deuteronomy chapter 18. And we're going to look at the last section. Uh, let's go to verse. Uh, we'll go up back a little bit. Let's go to verse 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken. According to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horeb in the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God, neither let me see this great fire any more that I die not. And the Lord said unto me, They have well spoken that which they have spoken. I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee, and will put my words in his mouth. Now, he didn't say her mouth. So a prophetess, or let me go this way, a woman is not classified in God's holy word as a prophet. I'm going to say something. You're not going to like it, but I ain't got nothing to do with it because I got to say what God told me to say. If you are a woman and call yourself a prophet, that is spiritual lesbianism. <gasps> what? Yeah. How? Because you're having an identity crisis. Because prophet is a male. Now you're saying you are a male. And men are only interested in what, well, real men are only interested in women. So a lot of you women who call you, now you, I'm not saying that you're a, an active, physical lesbian. I didn't say that. There's a such thing as a spiritual lesbian and a physical one. How? Because a physical one goes out and gratifies the flesh. But the spiritual one bears the, the fruit and the resemblance of Jezebel, who, if you know anything about Queen Jezebel, Jezebel was a freak. I'm going to put it out like that. Jezebel was into men and women. Jezebel was into whatever. Freakish ways. Because she was a high priestess in the religion of, of the worship of Baal. And if anyone know about the worship of Baal, then you know that there was a lot of homosexuality involved in that worship. 
Jezebel did not like male authority because she wanted to be in charge. She wanted to run the palace. And Ahab, who was very weak and sissified, and the reason I said sissified, I'm not saying the man was an active sissy, but I'm saying he was sissified because his fruit was sissyish. He had no backbone. He didn't stand up to his wife. He didn't carry the household. He wasn't acting like the head of the house. What he did is he let Jezebel have her way. He was spineless. He married Jezebel because her father, Ethbel, was the king of Tyre and Sidon. And Ethbel's kingdom was very prosperous and did a lot of trading. And Ahab wanted this type of carte blanche and prestige and position and power. So he agreed to marry Jezebel. And in doing that, that would make him related to Ethbel. Therefore, he would have connections. And what Jezebel did is she left her father's palace and took 850 false prophets of Baal along with her and brought them to Ahab's palace. And she tried to run things. She put a hit out on Elijah the prophet. Ahab went and told her, that Elijah killed all her prophets. And when he did, then Jezebel put the hit out. Ahab did and Jezebel did. Even though Ahab didn't like Elijah. When Ahab was mad because Naboth wouldn't sell him the vineyard, he came in the house and the palace all depressed and down and mashugan off, mashugan up, as the, the, the Jewish people would say. I just threw a spin on and said mashugan off because he was off. But he was mashugana. That means he, he was confused. He was he he was he was daft. He was aloof. He was bugging out. He just wasn't all there. He came in all distraught. And she said, What's the matter? And he told her. She said, Don't worry, you'll get it. Go lay down. Go get some rest. And he went and lay down and went to sleep. And his wife took his seal, the king's seal, not the queen's, the king's seal, wrote a letter, stamped it, and had it sent to Naboth. And Naboth got killed, and the vineyard now belonged to Ahab. So when he got up, his wife had a gift for him, the vineyard. Jezebel hates men and male authority. A woman who has a Jezebel spirit loves to argue, fight, fuss, snap, flip, all of that. And a man who lets her get away with that has an Ahab spirit. Because a man with a backbone and that type of woman with a Jezebel spirit will clash. She'll call him controlling and he'll say, you're not teachable, nor are you submissive. You have a Jezebel spirit. So you have these unlearned ministers, servants, that are saying men can have a Jezebel spirit. That's a lie. But they don't know no better. Why? Because they don't read. They don't read. You see this? This is only one part of the ministry's library. You can't see what goes on to the floor, but it goes to the floor all the way up here. This is a prayer box up here. And these are books and tracts and stuff. But all of these are Bibles and reference books. I got the works of Josephus, got Spanish Bibles, English Bibles, Hebrew, Greek, got a, a master's library collection and all kind of stuff. And under here, this po under this podium, nothing but Bibles and books and references 
Behind me over here, another bookcase, nothing but Bibles, books, and references. In my bedroom in there, three bookcases standing up tall, full with books overflowing. Until I'm married, all my time right now goes into the ministry. So I don't hang out in the street. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't cuss. I don't chase women. I don't do that. I'm waiting for God to fix my wife. Because when he fix her, I'm going to already have her rings. He said he's going to fix her. In scripture, Jacob had this dream about these angels going up to heaven, down to the earth, and back up to heaven. This is what he saw. And behold, this is Genesis 28, verse 13. Because remember, the Lord led me to say he was a prophet, and he was leading me to prove it in Deuteronomy 18. When the Lord said, in verse 18, we'll pick up from there. I will raise them up excuse me, a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him. That's what we left off at, that prophets and prophetesses, women that are in the prophetic office, they speak what God says. They don't speak on their own and because people don't know, they don't study, a lot of people don't study the word of God, they don't know what God said and didn't. Thank God that we're reading it now. Verse 18 again, of Deuteronomy 18, I will raise them up a prophet from among their brethren like unto thee and will put my words in his mouth and he shall speak unto them all that I shall command him and it shall come to pass that whosoever will not hearken unto my words which he shall speak in my name, I will require it of him, the one that's hearing the word. And it shall come to pass that whosoever, again, I'm going to read it, will not hearken unto my words, God's words, which he, the prophet, shall speak in God's name, God will hold that hearer accountable. So when God tell a prophet, the Lord says, the Lord says, the Lord says, on my Facebook, one of my Facebook accounts, every day the Lord give me like 10 to 12 words, posts. He just give me words just to put out there. God said, blah, 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 blah. God said, blah, because I spent, again, every morning when the Lord wake me up, the first 12 hours of my day, I am on an absolute fast. No liquids, no food, straight up absolute fast. In prayer, standing, fighting, praying, fasting. I've actually come down. I, before the fast, I was like 228. Now I'm down to 216. I didn't come on this fast with the intention of losing the weight. But that's what happened. That's what happened. Thank you, Jesus. That's what happened. And God said, But the prophet, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. I've seen it happen. I remember a friend of mine that was a prophet over 10 years ago. The Lord used me to help him get on television. And his, what a CNA would call clinicals, his volunteer time he had to do on this ministry show so he could get his license because I'm, I'm a certified TV producer I had two degrees one in studio one in field 
and the Lord was using me to help that brother to get some exposure on television and also to help him to, you know, learn how to use the equipment and stuff at the TV station. He was humble long as he was doing that. But the moment he got his own show, he started telling people he was God. Not only did he start telling people he was God, but he married a woman that <laughs> them two together, he thought he had somebody he was going to dominate and boss around, but he married a brawler. And he didn't know it. I knew it, but he didn't know it. And anyway, sometime later, the dude ended up dying. Because he started telling people he was God, and I'll make God kill you, and God is a murderer. And, and the Lord led me to go to him privately and say, Brother, listen, you need to stop. Because if you don't, God's going to deal with you. He walked away because he didn't want to hear it. Then the Lord led me to bring another brother to him and say, Brother, listen, you got to stop. He didn't want to hear that. Then the Lord led me to bring him before the body of Christ on television. And I was calling out the brother name and everything. What? You call out names? Sure do. Oh, yeah. Paul did in 2 Timothy chapter 4. Some people say, we shouldn't call out names. You shouldn't then. But us apostles, no, we, we, are, we have a mission. And a true apostle, which is only a male, called by the Holy Ghost, we uproot false doctrine and plant the truth. Sometimes we got to go in a place, a city, a town, a building, and tell the leader, you, come here for a minute, because you're off. Your theology is off. And ain't not, there's nothing worse than when you talk to someone who's not where they think they are, and God used you to try to help them, and they don't want the help because they think they're, they've arrived. They think they're all right. Uh-uh. In the city where I live, there's a lot of ministers that know me, and a lot of them don't like me. I could care less. Some of them is even family. I don't care because I have a, an, an agenda, an assignment. I, I want to go to heaven, and I want to hear God say, well done, thy good and faithful servant. So if anything is contrary to the word of God, an apostle is a teacher who's used by God to set up buildings? No, but to establish people in the faith of God. And so, even though an evangelist probably can't stand against a prophet, we can. Us apostles, because we stand in all four of the other offices. And God will use us to stand with a prophet and say, you need to go sit down somewhere. God said, but the prophet, verse 20 of chapter 18 of Genesis, which shall presume to speak a word in my name, which I have not commanded him to speak, or that shall speak in the name of other gods, even that prophet shall die. And if thou say in thine heart, your spirit, how shall we know the word which the Lord hath not spoken? You ready for this? Here's how. When a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not nor come to pass. That is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously, meaning arrogantly, you know. God said, in 10 days I declare and decree. No, stop. Because the only one who can declare and decree anything is God. No man can do that. God said. I saw that bug. He flew by. I'm going to get him. God said, when a prophet speaketh in the name of the Lord, if the thing follow not, nor come to pass, that is the thing which the Lord hath not spoken. But the prophet hath spoken it presumptuously. Thou shalt not be afraid of him. Don't be afraid of him. Don't pay it no attention. When I see them African guys on fake book, oh, the Lord said to tell you, blah, blah, blah. Man, look, they need to sit down somewhere. Because a lot of what they're saying, you got to understand, there's a lot of foreigners in other 
countries that prey upon Americans because they know that we are a rich country. We are a rich nation. We are a powerful nation. So they prey upon Americans. A lot of ministers that have no position or that are not humble, they'll hear a person from Nigeria or Kenya, anywhere else, write them in, oh, we, I want to invite you to Kenya. Come, come, come and preach. Oh, yes, the Lord opened that door. Yeah, okay. You go over there and won't come back. Once you, <laughs> yeah, I, right. you better stay home. When they invite me, I tell them my vision is for the United States of America. I'm not going ahead of God. And it's not that I'm scared because I'm a Kung Fu and I'm a Kung Fu master. I, what? I'm, it's not that I'm scared. But why go through all that? When I could just stay home and chill. <laughs> I, I'm not trying to do that. And there's a lot of people that go ahead of God. And they shouldn't. Then there's people that need to go to God. And they don't. God just shifted the message back this way. Jacob said in Genesis chapter 28, when he saw this ladder and the angels of God ascending and descending, and, and behold, the Lord stood above it and said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, thy father, and the God of Isaac. The land whereon thou liest to thee will I give it and to thy seed, and thy seed shall be as the dust of the earth, and thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south, and in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And when God says spread abroad, that means to break forth. And then verse 15, God says, and Behold, I am with thee and will keep thee in all places whither thou goest and will bring thee again into this land. For I will not leave thee until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awaked out of his sleep and he said, Surely, this, surely the Lord is in this place. And I knew it not. So he's a prophet. He's a prophet. He said, it says, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place? This is none other but the house of God. And this is the gate of heaven. And Jacob rose up early in the morning and took the stone that he had put for his pillows. This is a prophetic thing, y'all. And set it up for a pillar and poured oil upon the top of it. And he called the name of that place Bethel. And Bethel is, it means the house of God. But the name of that city was called Luz at the first. And Jacob vowed a vow saying, if God will be with me and will keep me in this way that I go and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Now he said, in other words, if God do everything that he told me in the dream that he's going to do. The important thing to notice is the work of angels. Angels. Because angels play a big part in our life and in this world. There's two types of angels. There's holy elect angels, the sons of God, and then there's fallen angels who are called demons. The Hebrew name for all demons is Mazakin. And what it means is one who does harm. I tell you, that's, that was a powerful show. That was really, really, really a powerful show. 
Join us the next time when the Lord leads us to go back in the scripture with some more information. Maybe it'll be with one of my friends. Maybe it'll be just me. I don't know. Either way, the Lord will be orchestrating the lesson. God bless you. And take care. <laughs> Till the next time. In Jesus' name. Lord, I just thank you for all that I have in you. And all that you are in my life. For all that you've done for thy servant. Lord, you're just so wonderful. You're just so wonderful. I can't think of how else my life would be without you. As long as I have Jesus, I have a satisfied mind. This is my prayer. Sometimes I Satisfied.